We live, we love, we serve. It brings me great joy to welcome back to FCBC the Reverend Dr. Timothy Sloan of the Luke Church in Humble, Texas. Come on, you got to thank God. I, I, I got to say this. This is my brother. I met Pastor Tim over 30 years ago at Morehouse College. He's a Morehouse graduate. He's a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, a graduate of Colgate Rochester University. He is a dynamic and amazing man of God. And more than that, he is one of the most powerful and yet humble pastors that I know. I'm truly grateful for his friendship, for his family, and most of all, for how God uses him in some powerful ways. And so I'm grateful that he came back here to FCBC this year to be a part of our Spring Revival. So FCBC, do me a favor, extend your hand in the direction and simply repeat after me, God use Pastor Tim. God bless Pastor Tim. God touch me that I might receive a word from you. Amen. After this election from our worship team, the next voice you will hear is that the pastor of this Luke Church in Humble, Texas, Reverend Dr. Tim Sloan. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Great is your faithfulness, God. And tonight, we come with that confidence that we've seen you move mountains. And we can testify that you will make a way. In fact, we believe you'll do it again. So let's start tonight, God. Speak to us in a way that is going to change our life. Give us a fresh word, God. That's going to give us the ability to stand no matter what comes our way. So tonight, God, let your word do the work. And let our hearts be receptive to what you have to say. Now, we speak to every demon of distraction that wants to try and keep us from hearing what you have to say. And we thank you in advance what you're getting ready to do in Jesus name we pray amen come on put your hands together let's celebrate the Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made and we don't have but one responsibility and that is we ought to rejoice and be glad in it so come on you're excited to be in God's house at least one more time won't you celebrate the Lord in this place? While you're still clapping, do me a favor and celebrate my beloved brother and friend, your pastor, the Reverend Michael A. Warren, Jr. Come on, let's praise God. What a gift. And listen, the last time I was here, I had written a book entitled Stand. And uh, uh, since then, I've, I've written another one, but I, I had a co-author with me. It's my 17-year-old daughter, Sarah. And, uh, we wrote a book together called Closer to You, uh, Developing Relationships Between Fathers and Daughters. And we sort of got engaged in it when the pandemic hit and realized you ain't got but a little bit of time together. Let's make the most of it. And so when we went through this process of praying together and intentionally getting closer to one another by getting closer to the father, the father, then, then we said, why don't we share this with the world and help other father and daughter relationships? And so it's now out. You can get that on Amazon. You can get that in Barnes and Nobles. You can get it on Target, Walmart. Um, I'm just grateful um, for her. And uh, she'll be a freshman next year at Spelman College. Yeah. <laughs> I am so excited about that. And uh, I praise God for her and her journey. I got other family members here tonight. Um, I, I don't want to 
point them out, but I'm so grateful for them um, being with me. Every time I come to FCBC, they're here, and I'm grateful for the Briggs family. I love them so much. Glad they're here now. And, and Nate, thank you so much for sharing with us. But I am excited about this word tonight, y'all. Uh, and so um, y'all pray with me. I think God's got a word for you. And uh, let, let's, let's go together in the book of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. When you get a chance, it really does benefit us to read this entire chapter. It kind of helps us to, to see the context of which we're going to be sharing together on tonight. But I want to just kind of pinpoint a couple of uh, verses that kind of help to really shape what I want to share with you, beginning at verse 35 and reading to you from the New International Version. Here's how the word of God is recorded. So while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. So why bother the teacher anymore? <laughs> and overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, mm -mm, don't be afraid, just believe. And this is the word of God. Let the people of God say thanks be to God. I want to talk to you tonight from the thought, I still believe. Would y'all help me to preach that? Just turn to your neighbor. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Look him in the eye and tell him, I ain't trying to get in your business. But you need to keep believing. Amen. Look right back at him and tell him, that's, that's advice both of us can use. Amen. Just keep on believing. Listen, I think I won't get any argument when I say that we live in a society that attempts to dictate that we ought to always be in a hurry. I mean, everything has to be done quickly. We're encouraged to accomplish as much as we can, as soon as possible, even if it's at the expense of other people. We look for stuff. We purchase items that are going to guarantee that we'll increase our efficiency and productivity. We don't want anything to slow down our pursuit of accomplishment. Uh, but there is one thing that will take some time, no matter how you look at it, and that is growing our faith. Growing your faith is not an overnight process. It, it is not something that can happen instantaneously. You cannot simplify it to a few rules for success. You can't buy it on the shelves of Barnes & Noble. It's going to require you to spend some time walking with God. Even more, it's going to take you having to deal with challenges in this life. And you ain't got to take my word for it. You can ask anybody in here who is a believer, and they will tell you developing your faith is going to take some time and some challenges. Now, I want you to know early on, I'm not trying to scare any new believers tonight. I'm not trying to push away any seekers in the house. I want you just to know that growing your faith will take time. In fact, I'm actually trying to encourage you to never let a few inconveniences or obstacles in your life cause you to stop believing. Don't you ever get to a place where you're committed to doubting the work of God. Being a believer, beloved, will not immunize you from problems, but it does change how you respond to your predicaments. And you again, you ain't got to take my word for it tonight. If I were to give you five minutes in here to poll the people on your row, at your house, on your job, they would tell you that trials only come to make you stronger. And I bet if we gave any one of them the opportunity, they could testify of a time when God showed up and they learned how to wait patiently on him. Beloved, God never does things the way we think he's going to do them. But in the end, I promise you will conclude God moves in mysterious ways. I hope y'all going to remember that tonight. Because challenges have a way of testing your faith. 
and they come at the most inopportune times. They don't never look at a calendar. They don't never consult you first. They don't ask you for your schedule. They're not trying to see your itinerary. They just show up. Health problems will show up at your door unannounced. Money problems will pick you out of the crowd and say, come here and let me holler at you. Grief will call you in the middle of the night and say, I just want to tell you a little something, something. Heartache will text you before you get out to bed in the morning and say, we need to have a talk this day. But when they come, don't you ever stop believing in the power of God. And sometimes you got to reinforce it with the mantra, no matter what it looks like, I still believe. I believe God can do anything but fail. Now let me pause right here real early and say that with all the difficulty in the world today, this is why I really am convinced that the black church has so much power. I agree with my sister, Dr. Brianna Parker. I still believe in the black church because it's only in the black church where we find the strength of melanin miracles who know the power of corporate prayer, corporate protest, and corporate worship. And even tonight, I'm convinced that the ancestors are leaning over the balcony of eternity and trying to tell somebody, no matter what you're going through, keep on believing. Whew. There are challenges, though, to believing. I need to tell you, there are challenges all of us go through, questions that all of us have, like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do children die? Why is there war and poverty if God is so good? And those are legitimate questions. When we get to heaven, all of us ought to pause and ask that. But until then, faith trusts God even when you can't trace him. And faith tells me it's the ability to be able to walk through fire and still hold on to the declaration, I believe. That's the story in our text tonight. Here's the story of Jairus, who is only one of a few people who actually appear in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jairus was a significant public figure. He wasn't just anybody. He was a significant synagogue leader at the time. He was actually the highest ranking religious figure in Capernaum. And things typically went his way. Had a good family had a good job, good benefits, excellent family, solid support system around him, and yet and still, he was not excluded from facing challenges. In fact, here's Jesus who meets him after just finishing preaching a major crusade to a crowd in Galilee. He left there and ends up catching a storm out on the Sea of Galilee where he was with his disciples and even then he was ministering to them because when they got worried about the struggles that they were facing, Jesus comes out and said, peace be still. The late verse of Henry of our church actually said, Pastor, I think Jesus stepped out and said to the water, peace. And then he looked at the disciples and said, now y'all be still. <laughs> because ministry never stops. And once they crossed over, they end up being met by a demon-possessed man in the region of the Gerasenes. And most folk who would have been with Jesus would have said to Jesus, it's getting late and I don't want to be no troublemaker, but that ain't our problem, that's his. But not Jesus. Jesus wanted them to see things are not always as they appear. Because what looked like was one was actually 10. But it didn't matter how many there were, none of them could stand against Jesus. I wish I had somebody who could say, let me co-sign on that. No matter what you come up against, just know that nothing can stand against the power of God. Jesus delivers the demon-possessed man and then after this act of deliverance, he gets back in the boat was probably getting ready to cross over to escape the crowd. But then that's when Jairus showed up. And when Jairus shows up, he also comes with his own challenge. His daughter is sick. And if you have ever had to care 
for a sick child, you realize that it can drive a parent to a point of desperation. And, and I don't know if, if he received any medical advice from any professionals. I don't know if he consulted some concierge physician, but I think he made the right choice when he decided to come to Jesus. And from a social standpoint, he does have a problem. The problem is, is that as a Pharisee, they were known to reject and ridicule Jews and Jesus. And here's another reminder, be careful about who you put down. Be careful about the folk that you exclude from your circle because the people you put down today might be the ones who you need in a little while to help you get through a real bad situation. And the sickness of his daughter and the itinerary of Jesus coincided so closely that what he actually needed was closer than he realized. The only issue now that he's facing is, with everything you're going through, do you still believe? And the questions on our minds tonight is, when challenges come our way, how do they help us to believe? I, I want to see if I can help you tonight with just a couple of quick things. The first one is, I believe that challenges help us to believe in the importance of prayer. Y'all with me? Regardless of culture, something in Jairus had believed that Jesus was a healer. And he literally fell at his feet and said to Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come put your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. Can I tell you something? No matter what stage you're at in your faith walk, you will face moments in your life where your faith will pull the covers off of you in public and say, now, you want to try and walk around here in camouflage and act like you're a believer on certain days and on other days you're not trying to fit in with certain crowds? Let me see if this situation will get your attention. And God will pull some stuff off of you to see if you're willing to testify, I still believe that you're able to do anything but fail. Whew. Hallelujah. It will call you out in the crowd to see if you still believe. If I were to open this up to modern day criticism in here tonight, I'm sure that somebody would say, now that sound real good. And um, I like your little speech tonight, but preacher. But my question is, why would Jairus leave his sick child to go and get Jesus? If he is as important as you say he is, if he's got as much clout as you say he does, why doesn't he send somebody else to go and get Jesus and bring Jesus to him? And therein lies the importance of prayer. Because I'm sure, like you, that's a good question, because most of us know the importance of having intercessors in our life. And intercessors are important. I believe in them. I believe you got to have people helping to pray you through. But can I tell you that prayer is not an errand you send somebody on? It is a discipline that you engage in. Because prayer is intended to change you personally. And at some point, I don't care how long you've been facing it, you're going to have to go to the Lord for yourself. And prayer is not some activity where you're trying to wrestle away a benefit from the hand of God. It's actually an opportunity for you to become more intimate with the Lord. Because the more you pray, the more you become acquainted with him and his character. True story, in Port Hope, Canada, there is a, a monument of a man, Joseph Scriven, who was born in 1820 in Dublin. And he ends up getting engaged to this beautiful young woman. 
but she tragically is drowned in a pond before their wedding. Scriver never really overcame the shock. He moved to Canada and became a devout Christian. Years later, there was a friend who was with him and he was by his bedside when Scriven was sick and he found a poem that Scriven had written. And you've heard the poem before, you just didn't know it was written by him. You might remember the lyrics, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. <laughs> What needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Every now and then, you got to learn how to go to God for yourself. And I know Pastor Walvoran prays for you. I know he prays over the FCBC family. But no matter how much he prays for you, no matter how much the deacons pray for you, no matter how long the prayer team labors over your request, no matter how often people come to pray for you through a situation, you are still going to have to learn how to pray for yourself. And the more you pray, the closer you get. Let, let, let me say this, that prayer also is not about reciting some formula. Prayer ain't about using the right words as some secret code to unlock the door to God's house. Prayer ain't even dependent upon the words you use. You ain't got to have no Shakespearean tone. You ain't got to throw in a bunch of thee and thou's. You ain't got to have the right tonality. You ain't got to be rhythmic with it. But you do have to have the right posture. And the posture is the way your heart is set up towards God. That's why not only should you pray, but you need to learn how to pray passionately. And passionate prayer pleads for the presence of the Lord. I'm not, I'm not telling you that you got to yell to get God's attention. I've never subscribed to that. That you got to say things a certain way in order to get God's attention. But... If you are desperate for him, it ought to sound like it every now and then. If you really want him like you say you do, then every now and then there ought to be some desperation in your voice. That, that's why I love the black church. I, I grew up in that time when um, the deacons would come to the front for devotional service. Didn't have praise and worship back then. You, you'd have them 45 minute long devotional services where the deacons would come and lay out and pray and you kind of always kind of knew what they were going to say. Here we are once again, Lord. Come before your humble throne. Body bent and head bowed. Just your humble servant thanking you that last night when I laid down, my bed wasn't my cooling board when I woke up this morning. And, and I'm going to be honest, I, I, I didn't care a whole lot for it when I was a child. But now that I'm older, I understand that there are times when you are going to have to learn how to open your mouth and pray to God and sometimes you're going to have to holler even if it's in a public place. You're going to have to learn how to call on the name of the Lord and if you've been with him a little while, you know that not only does he hear, but he responds to your prayer. Woo. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. There is power in prayer. Challenges help us to believe in the importance of prayer, but you know what else they do? They help us to believe in the witness of waiting. Mahalia Jackson uh, sang a song, You Can't Hurry God. You just have to wait, trust, and give Him time. No matter how long, there you go, you are, no matter how long it takes, He's a God that you can't hurry and you don't have to worry. He may not come when you want Him, but He's right on time. I believe that, Pastor Mike. I even remixed that thing. He may not come when you want him, but you're going to want him when he comes. 
That is a reality of faith, beloved. And we got to learn how to wait on God through unexpected interruption. It does not matter who you are. Everyone has to learn how to wait patiently. On the way to the house of Jairus, a woman shows up who interrupts the processional. And just like Jairus, she's got a desperate need too. The text says she'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But do you not know that Jesus does not treat them on a first come, first serve basis? He treats them both equally as important. Some of y'all will catch that later. Here are two people on opposite ends of the spectrum. Jairus is a public figure, and she's not even given a name. Jairus was a prominent figure known all over Capernaum, and she was a despised woman who had been sick for 12 years. Jairus is a religious leader, and she is even considered unclean. Old Testament law said that she literally had to stand 50 feet away from anybody that crossed her path and yell out, unclean, unclean. But regardless of their social standing, both of them were significant to Jesus. And one thing y'all is sure, Jesus does not treat us like we do other people. He does not determine his response time based on your popularity or what you can do for him. He cares about what's important to you regardless of who you are. But sometimes you just have to wait and watch him work. He didn't, he didn't meet this woman's needs and forget about Jairus. He didn't have some memory lapse as if he forgot where he was actually going. He just responded to the woman as a part of the processional. And sometimes in God's all-wise providence, he will allow us a chance to watch him work on a need for somebody else while we're waiting on him to meet the need we've actually brought to him. God will give us a chance to see how he handles the challenges in somebody else's life so that we can grow up in our own faith and we can find strength in watching the faith of somebody else. In fact, somebody is watching you right now. Somebody who knows what you're going through is watching to see how do you handle it and when God moves that mountain out of your way, they will know how to deal with that struggle when it comes their way. And they're learning right now by watching you how to keep believing in spite of what it looks like. Keep believing, beloved. Even if you've lost everything in the process, keep believing despite any obstacles that come your way, Keep believing that sooner or later, God will come through. But it's that in-between time, y'all, that, that, that in the meantime, that is not about you becoming some spectator. It ain't about you sitting over there and watching to see how God helps somebody else. It's a part of the process where you take the focus off of yourself and what you're going through and place it on the one who can turn it around in your favor. I, I know some of y'all still don't, don't buy this. That's all right. I, I know you're still sitting there thinking, um, again, appreciate your little speech, Brother Pastor. Thank you for coming from Texas tonight. But um, Jesus did not have to do Jairus and that little girl like that. I mean, for real, he, he could have let that woman get her little touch and keep it moving. 
why did he have to stop for so long to engage with this woman while he knew Jairus' daughter was dying? And y'all, you could be correct. But I think maybe Jairus was sitting there thinking, you know what? I do not mind waiting when I consider how patient he's been with me. When I consider all the wrong that I've done, all the places that I've been, all the stuff that I've said, and he's still willing to come see about me, I really don't mind waiting. Because one thing is for sure, I am still on his itinerary. So instead, beloved, of watching the clock, trying to see how and when things are going to work out, Jairus is experiencing the buildup of his faith. He is growing through the process of waiting. And unbeknownst to Jairus, he is literally becoming personally acquainted with the healing power of God. Sometimes God will allow you to see an exact replica of what he needs to do in your situation while on the way to your situation through the experience of somebody you know. So Jairus is observing how Jesus could literally heal with just one touch. I don't want to play the role of spoiler, but in a little bit later, you're going to see Jesus use one good touch to help change the life of his daughter. And all the time, Jairus is stockpiling his faith for himself. So even if his situation takes a while, when he gets to it, Jairus already has concluded, I believe that he can do anything but fail because I've seen him heal other folk. I have seen him move mountains. I have seen him turn situations around. I have seen him deliver from the hand of the enemy. And somebody in here tonight can testify, if you don't believe it, just look at me, I am a walking miracle. <laughs> if you only knew everything I've been through, if you only knew the struggles I've had to deal with, if you only knew the pain I've had to endure, if you only knew the heartbreak I've had to hold on to, if you only knew some of the healing I was desperate for, you could understand why I've been waiting on God patiently, and trusting that he can do anything, hey, God, but fail. Hallelujah. Challenges help. Help you to believe. To keep on believing in the importance of prayer. Challenges help you to believe in the witness of waiting. And lastly, they help us to believe in the demonstration of discipleship. Because being a disciple is not about wearing some badge. Being a disciple is not about having a particular title. Being a disciple is not about how long you've been a member of the church. It is not based on how people identify you. Discipleship is based on how you live every day, especially when nobody's looking. I know you look good when everybody's watching you. I know you know how to dress up when folk are around, but how do you handle yourself when you're at home by yourself? How do you handle yourself when trouble knocks on your door? I know you can get up in here, and you can get up in here, and you can raise your hands, and you can worship when the spirit is high in the church, but can you worship when your whole life is falling apart, and it's Tuesday afternoon? I know you can pray, especially when you are surrounded by other folk. I know you can call on the name of God, but can you lay on your face prostrate when you at home all by yourself? Can't get nobody on the phone, but you know how to call on the name of the Lord. Whew. The Bible said, hallelujah, the Bible said that while Jesus was still speaking, some people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, 
came and said, hey, Jay, uh, Jay, your daughter is dead. And uh, we don't even need to keep bothering the teacher anymore this afternoon. Now, that's Warren, from an observational standpoint, that seemed reasonable. They're right. The girl was dead. There was really no need to keep going with this processional. It, they were right. But for somebody who's been close to Jesus, this does not make sense to end. When you've been this close to Jesus and you've seen him heal, you don't allow somebody else to try and dictate to you when you ought to give up on your faith. The devil is a liar. I've been with him too long. I've seen him take me through too many troubling situations. I've watched him turn some stuff upside down and inside out, and I've come too far, hallelujah, to turn back now. And if you hadn't been walking with the Lord like you have, you would have come to the same conclusion. But since you've watched him work up close, you already know Jesus is not racing a clock. He holds time in his hand. You, you walk close enough with Jesus to see that regardless of the situation, I know if nothing else, he's able. Oh, yes, he is. He's able to do anything but fail. And walking with the Lord changes how we respond to attempted misdirection. Because some things you prayed about years ago seem to have gone unanswered. But can I tell you, God has not forgotten about you. God did not deny your requests. God didn't put your prayer on layaway. Just because it hasn't happened in your time doesn't mean that his timing is still not perfect. Because if God gives you a word, you got to allow that word time to work no matter how long it takes. If it's been a while, just keep on believing. Sometimes you got to take time to remind yourself, don't you give up. You got to tell yourself, I know it hadn't happened yet, but I believe he did not forget about me. He did not bring me this far just to leave me. I wish I had somebody who could say, I'm with you, brother preacher, because sooner or later, this thing will work out in my favor. Woo, hallelujah. God's going to turn it around. I, oh, God, you ought to tell somebody sooner or later. God is going to work that thing in your favor. Come on, y'all are helping somebody. Turn somebody else. Tell them sooner or later. God is going to work that thing in your faith. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what people are saying. God is not through with you yet. And he makes all things work together for his good. Yes, he does. Because there's power in God's word. And God's word shows up just when you need him the most. True story in uh that was warm in 2005 in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, there was a violent storm that caused the ceiling to collapse at Action Motors. And they had to send all the employees home early. Ed Nan Lima was an employee there. And uh, on his way home that afternoon, he happened to see 19-year-old Andrew Higginbotham, true story, about to jump off of the Casper Street bridge into the Still River in Connecticut without even thinking. Lima jumped in to get the kid out who had earlier told his mom he was going to kill himself. He was trying to get out of the rescuer's hands, but what Andrew discovered was that Lima was bigger than him 
and stronger than him. And Lima was able to wrestle him out of the river and saved his life. But that ain't your shout cue. Because after they were sitting on the side of the bridge, the police came by. And when they saw Lima, they looked at him and said, oh, it's you again. Four months earlier, he was on his way home when he saw a house on fire. And Lima ran in to bring four people out so that when the police showed up, they said, it's you again. I wish I had his number, because I tell Andrew the same thing happened to me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Come on, help me now. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. And when you go through situations that are troubling, you're going to find out God will send the word you need just when you need it the most to bring you out of a sinking place. When Jesus overheard what they said, he looked at Jairus and he said, Jairus, don't listen to them. Don't be afraid. Just believe. He didn't need to give Jairus a medical explanation. He didn't need to tell him why he thought that his daughter was asleep and not dead. He just said, Jairus, keep on believing. And that's my message to you tonight, that no matter how things look, just believe. No matter what you're going through, just believe. No matter how long it's taken, just believe. No matter how hard your heart hurts, just believe. No matter how much you've lost, just believe. Don't you give up on God, because God won't give up on you. Y'all gonna help me close with a little sermon tonight. Look at somebody and tell them, just believe. Tell them no matter what you're going through, just believe. Come on, find somebody in here tonight and tell them no matter how hard it gets, just believe. And don't stop there. Keep on believing. Whatever you're going through, keep on believing. No matter what you find yourself dealing with, keep on believing. You've come too far to give up now. And if your dissenters ask you, how do you still believe? You can tell them because he gave me his word. He said he was going to do it. And if he said he was going to do it, surely he's going to show up and bring me out. Somebody in here tonight can testify. God gave me his word. He told me he didn't forget about me. He told me that trouble don't last always. He told me that the midnight is only for a little while. He told me that this thing is going to turn in your face. He told me, hang on in there. He told me, don't you quit believing. He told me, sooner or later, God's going to turn that thing around. I need, I need a few folk in here tonight who ain't ashamed to say I still, I believe, I still, I still believe with everything I've gone through, I still believe with everything I've had to face, I still believe, yes, yes, I still believe, I still I still believe I've been through some trials and some tribulations. I've had some heartache and some pain. But through it all, I remember that he loves me and he cares and 
he'll never, 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 never put more on me than I can bear. What's up, FCBC? Pastor Trey here. Listen, thank you for watching, but don't stop just there. Be sure to like and subscribe at FCBC NYC. You'll get updates on sermons, announcements, and anything else that you might be interested in. But don't forget, you gotta subscribe at FCBC NYC. Thank you.